<laughs> All right, good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, it's good to be a, a part of the um, conservation conversations um, series, and uh, I wasn't aware that I was the last in the series, so, so it's uh, nice to, to um, wrap up this um, series on um, sand parks and, uh, um, you know, birding within um, these wonderful areas. And I, I really hope um, this evening that I, I can do it justice um, highlighting um, some of the incredible avifauna um, that we have in, in Macala uh, and just really encourage people, for those who haven't been to the park yet, um, to, to really just enjoy what is on offer um, within Macala. Um, I think we all agree that uh, we all love visiting our national parks. Um, and being an avid birder and ornithologist, I, I just believe that birds just bring so much more added value um, during our visits. Um, but of course, it's not only about the birds, but it's about biodiversity. It's about linkages and I think appreciation of uh, what nature has to offer. And so um, hopefully I, I will be able to uh, get through all of that tonight um, by looking at the birds and uh, birding opportunities in Macaulay National Park. Right, so let's get going. I uh, have a fair amount to um, cover this evening. Right, so the outline um, of the talk, just going to look at some history and the background, have a look at the Macaulay map. Um, really important to have a look at uh, the different habitats that we have. Um, have a look at the accommodation because that actually um, you know, forms quite an important part of the birding that actually takes place um, within our, our, our national parks. Then we're going to go on and have a look at the, at the bird diversity itself. Um, where's the best places to go and, and, and find birds um, and um, you know, run through a whole range of uh, um, hopefully some uh, nice pretty pictures. Um, showing the bird diversity that we have. Um, I think everybody can appreciate. I, I'm not going to be able to get through um, everything um, uh, that, uh, that we have on the bird list, um, but I uh, um, hopefully will be able to show you um, some of the specials and uh, um, some of the interesting places that one can bird in Macaulay. Then have a look at some uh, other ac activities. And I'd like to end off by um, having a look at the kind of research that takes place in the park and especially have a look at uh, citizen science initiatives. All right, so a bit of the history and uh, background. Um, and uh, Macaulay actually um, came out of Falbos National Park. So, so Falbos was um, established in, in 1986. Um, and uh, you can see the area that I'm indicating on the screen there. Um, but it was deep proclaimed in uh, 2002, and this was due to a land claim that uh, had got up and running since 1997. And uh, so from the deep proclamation, Sand Parks was looking for a new area to establish a new national park. Uh, and that all came to fruition in uh, 2007, uh, when they gazetted the proclamation of Mukala. Uh, and this was after successful negotiations with the landowners um, in that area. And uh, what is really significant to the, uh, the, the kind of information that I was um, able to, uh, um, to find with regards to this new proclamation of a new national park, that it was one of the largest animal translocation exercises that have taken place. And they managed to translocate every single animal from Falwolf um, all the way through to uh, Macala. So it was a huge exercise and uh, a, a huge thumbs up to, to Sand Parks for um, finding the property, purchasing it, and then translocating all those animals. Uh, so what's in the name? Um, and and uh, sorry, before I carry on, I just, I forgot to mention uh, um, earlier, sort of in my intro, that I, I see a lot of people have been to Macala, and that's great to see. Um, and so I think a lot of you will be familiar with uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, the birds I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, but uh, I guess that there will be a large number of people who, who haven't been. And so um, hopefully uh, the, the real emphasis around this particular talk is to encourage those who haven't been um, to get to Macaulay and uh, share that experience. So 
Macaulay is the Setswana name for camel thorn. Uh, and uh, there you can see a, a really nice um, photograph of a camel thorn. It's a very popular one. I think uh, a lot of people have taken photographs of it. Um, this is quite um, close to Mosu camp. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful iconic tree found in desert regions. And it's quite widespread across the northern Cape and into parts of the Northwest. And, uh, you know, these uh, trees occur in these dry woodland and uh, arid, stony, sandy areas. And, you know, they provide enormous shade for um, um, uh, the animals that can be found in the area. Um, and uh, it uh, provides home to um, sociable weaver colonies, um, as we um, can be quite familiar with in, in this um, part of the world. Uh, so essentially it's providing really good microhabitat for um, a whole range of, um, of different species. But it's an incredible resource to um, not only to wildlife, but also to humans who, who survive in these harsh conditions. And, and quite interestingly, the, the, the gum and the bark have been used by local tribes to, to treat coughs and colds, nosebleeds, and uh, even tuberculosis. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, the roasted seeds are, are used as a substitute for coffee. Uh, I haven't tried that yet, uh, uh, but perhaps one of the things that I need to do. Uh, the local indigenous people from Namibia have, have also made powder from the inner bark uh, that was used to perfume the, the body and the home. Um, farmers say it's an excellent fodder um, source and uh, it's also used um, is really good firewood. It's widely um, re renowned in those circles. So it's, it is an extremely valuable resource. Um, and uh, that's where the National Park um, got its name. It's a very popular tree um, that can be found within the boundaries of the park. And uh, I was here about three weeks ago and, and uh, currently the, um, all the um, um, camel thorns are in flower. These really pretty, yellow flowers, which give off a very potent scent. Um, and these are the uh, um, specifically shaped pods um, that um, get produced um, uh, from the camel thorn. So one of the main management goals of Macaula is to breed rare and endangered species. Um, and, and this is to conserve the breeding populations. Um, and uh, we, you know, we have things from white rhino to roan to sable, um, African buffalo, which are disease free, um, which is um, in comparison to the um, kind of um, problems they have up in the, up in the Kruger area, um, where these animals are prone to foot and mouth and tuberculosis. Um, Sesebe um, is another one of the rare antelope species that gets conserved in Mukala. Um, and what's important is that the reserve um, um, you know, acts as this, uh, as this breeding factory um, for a whole range of, of, of these rare and endangered antelopes. Um, and as a result of that, they are able to act as feeders to other national parks. And so this is a, a really significant role that, uh, that Macaulay plays. It's a relatively small national park. Um, and uh, so... Um, one of the other ways in which they, are, they need to maintain the genetic diversity um, is that often they will uh, swap, um, especially animals like white rhino, for example, with other national parks, um, and this is to avoid inbreeding. So it plays an a, a extremely significant role um, in um, conserving breeding populations um, of these rare and in endangered species. And I've thrown in a picture of the black springbok here um, and uh, it's obviously not uh, endangered species but this is um, just Im important to note that the, uh, that uh, the, the are black springbok and copper springbok within Macaulay and these are just color mutations um, due to a recessive a gene that has apparently been in springbok populations in the past and uh, now it occurs naturally um, and before the national park was proclaimed, the, the landowners got involved with selected breeding, um, but it's not part of um, Sandbox mandate. 
um, to continue breeding um, with these color mutations and just leaving it um, to the natural cycles. So I just uh, thought that was interesting for those who perhaps um, may not know about these um, color mutations in the in the springbok populations. And if you do visit Macaula, um, you can certainly look out for them. All right, let's have a look at uh, the park itself. Um, and some fast facts about uh, the park. So we're looking at a park, it's only about 30,000 hectares in size. We've got 10 different vegetation types. And uh, we will have a look at those um, shortly in a little bit more detail. Two main camps, uh, one a camping site. Uh, we have one private cottage uh, that is Falcon Steak. Uh, we've got three treetop cottages. Um, so for example, Camille Doering, a treetop cottage, Dinner King and Motswedi. And these are really popular. Um, and I believe that they are going to be constructing more of these uh, treetop cottages. There's seven main loops in the park. Um, just run through them quickly. We've got the Fall Balls Loop at the top here. There's the America King, uh, which leads into the Mellifera 4x4 loop at the dotted line. Then we've got a smaller loop, the Kineki Loop, uh, the Camille Doering Loop that runs around here into the Doernlock the Loop. Um, and then we've got two loops in the south of the park, um, the Sesebi Loop and the Matopi Loop. Um, so those are the um, seven uh, loops within the park that um, provide access and the road infrastructure um, with, for the uh, public to enjoy uh, the biodiversity uh, within Mokala. Here's one bird hide and uh, we're going to spend some time having a look at uh, what happens at Stoff Dam bird hide. Two picnic sites, uh, Matopi and Camille Doering, and then numerous watering points. And we're going to be having a look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, so the, the park actually is more or less in the center of South Africa. Um, and it's about 50 kilometers from Kimberley you know, um, to the Lilydale uh, main gate. Um, so um, like myself living in Kimberley, it's really accessible. And so um, obviously to try and spend as much of my time there um, as I can. Uh, the other main entrance gate at Mosu is a little bit further, um, but uh, generally we're looking at anywhere between 60 or 70 kilometers from Kimberley. All right, so that's just some information about uh, the park itself. Um, and uh, we will now go on and have a look at some of the habitats. And so what I'd like to do is is this is a, 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 um, a GIS, a generated um, habitat map. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the technical details here, but um, what I would like to do is show you some, some images that represent the different habitat types that can be found in the park. And that gives one a really nice idea um, about the kind of bird diversity that we can expect. Um, and uh, with those, images in mind, um, then we will be able to have a look um, at the representative avifauna um, with, within the park. So to begin off with, we're going to have a look at the Reed River. Now the Reed River runs along the northern boundary, it's about eight kilometers, and this is going to form your right riparian zone. Um, the um, Moda River um, uh, flows into the Reed River um, further upstream, and that's one of the major catchments within the area. So there's tremendous volume of uh, water that pushes through um, from the Moda River through into the Rit River. Um, and uh, um, as I said, forms the northern boundary of um, the park. Uh, then we've got a, a, a uh, area just south of the of the Rit River. So we, we can call it the northern section where we have um, um, umbrella and camel thorn sort of open woodland. Um, uh, but it also constitutes some really dense fallbos thickets. Um, and uh, the, the, the fallbos loop was, uh, uh, I think, so called because of these very dense um, fallbos thickets that occur in that particular region. Right, then the next section, this brown section over here, 
Um, this is dominated by a blackthorn um, and uh, sort of alternates between open and closed woodland. So when we're looking at the closed woodland, we're having a look at these blackthorn thickets. Um, and in some parts, it can get really, really thick. Um, and uh, uh, it, as you drive through this particular area on um, one of the loops, uh, it, 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 it really drives home as, as to how dense uh, these uh, blackthorn thickets can get. But it, it also changes quite rapidly be between an open and a closed woodland um, situation. So it's um, offering different microhabitats to birds um, within this particular zone. Then a little bit further south, more or less in the center um, of the park, again, we um, have umbrella and a blackthorn uh, trees are dominating, um, but it's, it's forming a little bit more open woodland here um, com compared to the blackthorn thickets um, that we um, spoke about previously. Um, so, so things become a little bit more open um, and there's a, there's a lot more sand um, that, that, that is around. Uh, and uh, again, providing a completely different habitat um, for the, the birds that we're going to have a look at shortly. Then we have uh, Schmittia Plains, um, and uh, Schmittia is this Kalahari sand creek grass, and uh, kind of dominates the, the sand felt area uh, within the park. Um, it's a huge um, grassy plains um, that uh, can be found in this area. Uh, and uh, Again, this is going to um, sort of provide um, and, and host a particular number of uh, specific avifaunal species within that habitat. Uh, if we move on to the next section, um, we this, this sort of light green, um, and this is part of the um, sort of only major drainage area um, within the park. But it's dominated by a buffalo thorn um, and um, sunadin or couch grass. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of open woodland, um, uh, as you can see by this particular image here. And in the background, you can already get a hint of uh, um, some of the other major landscape features uh, that are present in the park. Right, a little bit further south, now we're um, heading towards Mosu. We've got Rygozum and a, a Blackthorn open scrubland. Um, Rygozum is uh, also known as the yellow pomegranate, produce really nice um, yellow flowers, um, and, uh, but it's a lot more open, um, large patches of, uh, of, of couch grass as well, um, intermingled amongst the Rygozum um, Blackthorn mosaic. Then uh, we have a, a section on the western side, which uh, um, again becomes dominated by umbrella thorns and camel thorns, but it's more open woodland um, in this particular region. And then we have a region, um, or, or a Pacific habitat type that's um, quite unique to Makala. This is the, the what's called the dolerite poppy felt uh, with um, blackthorn thickets um, at the bases of the slopes. And so, um, everything to the east of this red line are basically in this particular section over here um, is where these dolerite poppy felt um, can be found. So there's um, higher elevation, um, which gets dominated by these poppies and, um, and uh, the blackthorn thickets and the open woodland um, at the, the base become quite dominant um, within this particular area. And then um, I've just thrown in um, Boschia, this is the shepherd's tree, um, which has this extremely um, white uh, trunk. Uh, it's quite unique to um, the area region as well, um, indicating high salt content in the, in the soil. And this is intermingled amongst all um, these different, you know, open closed umbrella, blackthorn, um, camel thorn woodland areas. But it's more a, a species that is a dominant in the western part um, of, of the park. Okay, so that uh, basically um, hopefully gives you a, a nice graphic picture as to the, the different kinds of habitats. And you can see there's um, quite a lot of similarity between some of the areas, um, uh, just in terms of being open or closed woodland. But basically we're having a look at um, a, a Calahori thorn felt 
um, type habitat uh, with you know within the park. Um, but these dolerite poppy felt areas um, are also quite important to take note of. Okay, and I've put these four um, images in because when you drive through Makala, these are the kind of habitats that you drive through. Uh, and so you have your big open uh, grassy uh, Schmidia plains, um, and of course they're going to be home to a whole range of species. You have your, um, your umbrella, uh, and uh, camel thorn, um, open slash closed woodland type areas. Yeah, you've got uh, sort of your adolorite uh, copies with your ephemeral pans and uh, the um, adolorite copy felt um, in the bottom right. And uh, these are, um, you know, really the images and the and the habitats that 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 one encounters as you drive through. Uh, the park, and again, highlighting how how the avifauna is um, going to be shaped by these different habitat types. All right, so I'm quickly going to just run through the accommodation, um, and uh, um, so that we have a picture of uh, what these camps look like. Uh, Amosu Lodge uh, is the main camp, um, and uh, again, aptly named, uh, coming from the Siswana word for um, thorn uh, and what's nice about um, uh, Mosu is that there is a, a water hole right at the bottom of the of the camp um, and one could sit there and just enjoy the, the, the animals that come and drink and uh, it might be lucky to get a white rhino uh, to come through like I did on, on one occasion. Uh, so that's the main camp at Mosu Lodge and then the other main um, rest camp is Lidedale Lodge um, in, the, in the north. So yeah we have a picture with the root with the Reet River um, that runs at the bottom of this ridge um, on which um, the, the, the camp is situated. And yeah, has just some images um, showing the type of uh, accommodation and, and the adorables that um, one can expect. Uh, Harkin Steer Cottage, this is this uh, private cottage um, and can take up, up to a maximum of four people. You have your own private water hole. Um, and so if you're really wanting to get a more private experience, um, uh, then uh, you can um, spend some time and uh, book Hark and Steer Cottage. The luxury um, campsites, uh, I've heard from a lot of people, I'm not a camper, um, but they um, really rave about um, the more steady luxury campsites. So there's individual campsites, each with their own pollution facilities. Um, and the treetop cottages, which are um, becoming very, very popular, um, as I mentioned. Um, so these accommodate only up to two, two people, but you also have your own private waterhole that um, is uh, attached to each of these um, treetop cottages. So there's a whole lot of um, birding opportunities that, that, that one can have as well. Obviously, if you um, at Hock and Steak or um, you book into one of the treetop cottages, um, then you will have uh, um, these these um, opportunities to to bird around the waterhole and um, within um, some, some of the the um, tree canopy and and the other thickets that surround um, those particular cottages. Okay, let's move on to the bird diversity. So you can see I've got a, a official, unofficial list, and I've got the Sabbath 2 list. Yeah. Um, so the, the official list, which um, I kind of regard as being unofficial, <laughs> um, just because uh, there, there is some variation with regards to the list that I've been um, able um, to, to, to get my hands on so that I could have a look at uh, the sort of overall diversity that's present in Makala. But generally speaking, when I look at those lists, there's about 251 species um, that um, can be listed. Um, when I extracted the SABAP2 data, which covers seven pentads, um, that's the tightest fit I could find um, for Makala, then um, about 270 species you know, comes out of that list. But the but that particular list really needs to um, still be verified. There, it's, it seems to be a few species on there that I'm a little bit uh, um, concerned about. Um, there might just be mis-IDs, um, uh, and uh, so there's a lot more verification that needs to take place uh, with regards to that. 
Um, but generally speaking, we can say that anywhere between 250 and uh, 270 species um, occur within the national park. And just to say that I am busy with the um, a exercise to um, um, to, re to refine the the Macaulay bird list and uh, um, get it up to date um, so that we can make it official. But I think the biggest um, uh, thing that we need to take note of here is that it's dominated by resident species. In fact, eighty-seven percent of the of the birds on the the list um, are, are your thornfeld savanna and your grassfeld um, species that reside not only in Macaulay but in the surrounding um, sort of region as well, um, sort of within this this dry semi-arid biome. Um, there's only a small percentage that uh, are migrants. I mean, we're looking at about 13% plus minus. Um, so there is not a, a big migrant population um, or diversity within the park. And that is the same for the water bird uh, you know, diversity as well, um, which hovers around 11%. Um, so, and I think this is just really due to the fact that there's no large wetland systems uh, within um, the, the, the park. Um, and I will get on to speaking about this um, shortly. Um, just um, two nice pictures of uh, some of the resident um, um, birds that uh, can be found uh, within the park. Or your Cape Robin Chat and your Acacia Pied Barbet, which are fairly um, common within Macaulay. Okay, so now I'm going to move on and um, have a look at where do you go to to find birds, where um, where are the best spots uh, to to go and do your birding? Um, so what I've tried to do here is I've I'm trying to call them hot spots, and I've got them in some sort of descending order. Um, and uh, this is just obviously based on uh, my experience within the park, um, but but I think I think it holds true. Um, so. Top of the list, we have our, our, our water holes, where our, our watering points. I think these are are the priority sites where um, one can spend some time and uh, really waiting for the birds to come to you. Um, but indicative of uh, the the kind of avifaunal diversity within um, that particular uh, area within uh, the, the the park itself. Um, I think we all know. Um, whichever national park we visit that some of the best birding is actually done within the camps itself or within the um, campsites. Uh, and I think this also holds true as well for Mukala. Um, so we've got, and I've just highlighted those with the, um, the blue squares. Then we've got the picnic areas, which also um, are, I think, extremely um, valuable spots in, in which to, uh, uh, you know, to to find birds within those particular regions. Um, you know, we, we always know the picnic areas are a, a very good opportunity to, to um, stop, get out, stretch your legs, but to obviously walk around the picnic site. Um, and uh, often you can um, really, you know, pick up some really special birds by just doing that. Then this area that I've highlighted here in the brown um, uh, is the the roads, the road network that runs through these uh, rocky hillsides. And so um, these will kind of be the, the opportunities where um, you, you will need to um, keep a lookout for um, um, some of the specials um, that um, one can find um, in, in these Adolorite coffee felt areas. Um, so I think what's indicative here is only found in the southern half um, um, of, of the park. Um, and uh, so basically we're running from these sort of grass felt areas and these open woodlands in the, in the, the north to these um, more hilly um, dolerite coffee felt areas uh, within the south. And then lastly, I've um, put in a general driving. In other words, as you drive around the park, as you do in other national parks, obviously that's going to offer um, loads of, of uh, opportunities to, to find birds as you drive through this, um, this habitat diversity. Um, and uh, it, it, that's especially true for your roadside birds. 
um, and uh, we will um, be able to identify some of those as we go through in the next section. But for me, um, this is the kind of priorities that, uh, that I would place on um, going to um, these areas in order um, to um, focus on trying to maximize the number of species that you can find um, in Makala. And I've, as you can see, most of the other watering points with these red stars, I've uh, made the star for twelve time a little bit larger because for me that becomes a real priority. And uh, I'll get onto that. Right, um, the top six. Right, and I, it's, it's not the top five or the, the uh, top 10, but what I've done is I've, I've taken the, the data from the bird atlas for those seven pentads and I've looked at the reporting rates um, uh, in a descending order um, that have come out of all the cards that have 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 been submitted um, to the Bird Access Project to SEDAP2. Um, and these are the percentages that come out. Um, uh, so in other words, when you go to Macaulay, um, the issue, these six birds should, should be on your list. You should, if you miss one of these species, then uh, you know uh, there's there, there's something wrong. <laughs> Um, so, Kalori, Scrub Robin, Scaly Feathered Weaver, a Chestnut Vented Warbler, Cape Starling, the Yellow Canary, and the Black Chested Prenier, uh, actually together with the, um, the Ringneck Dove, or the, the old name, the Cape Turtle Dove, um, share that 73.6%. So, um, you know, these are going to be the, your most common species that you're going to find um, within Makala. Um, I'm a little bit surprised um, that that is not 100% um, for at least uh, the, the Kalahari scrub robin and uh, scaly feathered weaver um, uh, and, and even something like the yellow canary and, and uh, the black chested prenier. Um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, that's the data that comes out of the bird atlas. All right, then moving on to what I'm, I'm going to call the specials. Um, and uh, these are, are birds I've identified as being special. Um, and uh, I may have um, missed a handful, but I, I think these are um, some of the, the, of the special birds that um, if you go to Makala, um, you should be able to, um, you know, to find and, and to tick because they have some special association with the habitat. So pygmy falcon, um, yeah, I think, you know, if you're a beginner birder or a novice birder, this is one of the birds that uh, you really want to get on your list. Um, and uh, of course, Macaulay is not the only place, but but if you go to Macaulay, um, there is a really good chance that you will be able to find pygmy falcon because they associate with um, sociable weaver colonies. Um, and even the sociable weaver in itself is um, a really special tick um, for, um, for the region. Um, so, so by, by looking for sociable weaver colonies, spend a little bit of, of, of time at the colonies, um, there's a very good chance that you will be able to, to find pygmy falcon. Uh, another special is um, Sacred Bird, and I know um, that bird life uh, is um, working on this particular species, uh, but uh, um, if you um, go to, especially in the northern parts of the, 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 the park, you will be able um, to um, hopefully find a, sacri a, a secretary bird or, or, or two walking around within the grasslands. Uh, the next three species are your um, Cory Busted, your Red Crested Koran, and your Rufus Ed Warbler. Um, so heaviest flying bird um, in, um, is the Cory Busted. Um, I, I don't always pick the bird up, but I think I've um, at least half the time I visit uh, Macaulay, I'm able to tick it. The Red Crested Koran um, is a bird you um, will definitely see along, along the roadside. Um, and uh, um, actually, you most likely to hear it first um, rather than see it. Uh, and Rufus Ed Warbler, again, is a, is a really special tick. Um, uh, it's uh, um, quite a common bird um, within Macaulay. Um, and this particular bird, I, I, I found one. Um, morning very early um, and it was um, basically just waking up uh, within one of the small thorn trees. Um, I think it was along the Sessibi loop. Uh, but again, it's a very special bird um, that's linked to these 
dry semi-arid habitats. Okay, so I'm, I mentioned um, the red crested Quran, uh, and uh, this is going to be a familiar sound. Okay, so like I said, you 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 often hear the bird before you see you see it, um, but it's very common along the roadside, especially driving along the main road from Lilydale down to Mosu. Right, some of the other specials, um, a crimson bitter shrike, um, uh, which is uh, a very iconic bird within the Thornfelt. Um, a Cape Pendulum tit is a really special ticket Mokala, um, and uh, I haven't I've I've only seen it once. Um, but it's, um, you know, probably, um, uh, I think, a lot more common in, in particular areas with, within the park. Um, and if you spend, um, I think, a fair amount of time um, sort of searching um, within uh, the, the, the sort of um, blackthorn thickets and, and, the, and the, the closed woodland, um, you will uh, most likely be able to, to find this um, this particular bird, and you know, we all know that it's extremely small, being one of the smallest birds, if not the um, smallest bird within um, South Africa, and it's very characteristic um, nest, which uh, um, is built from uh, um, will you plant down or, or animal fibers, um, um, which um, usually comes from sheep wool and uh, held together by spider's web, and it has uh, two entrances. The one at the top is the true entrance which closes automatically, and there's a false entrance that the bird builds at the, at the bottom um, to fool predators. Karoo uh, scrub robin, uh, for me, is a really special tick uh, um, with, within Macaulay, um, and uh, it can be found at Lilydale. Uh, if you take the fall ball sloop, virtual sand grass is virtually guaranteed. Um, uh, so this is um, um, one of three sand grass species that can be found in Macaulay. The common scimitar ball, um, common around the camps, uh, but can also be found um, sort of in, in, the, in the open woodland areas and double banded corsa, which you need to look out for. Um, it blends very nicely um, into the sandy areas um, in, in, in some parts of the, of the park, uh, but between the Lilydale Gate and the Lilydale Lodge, um, uh, do look out for it um, if you um, go in at the Lilydale Gate. Right, let's have a look at some birds of prey. And I just want to make a, a point. Obviously, there's going to be some overlap. For example, um, the pygmy falcon, I've already discussed on a big special. So I'm just going to have a look at some others. Um, white baked vulture, I will speak to just now. Pale chanting, a goshawk, a very common, um, and uh, it, especially within the arid zone. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you should, should not leave the park without seeing pale chanting, a goshawk. Leopard face. Vulture um, also um, occurs um, often in uh, mixed colonies with the white-backed vulture, often find it soaring, so do look up in the skies. Uh, Gabar goshawk um, is also um, fairly common in the park. I, I see it fairly frequently. Um, he has a nice adult bird, um, and the, uh, the, the image to the right is um, a juvenile bird, which uh, uh, I think it was my last visit. I was um, really able to enjoy some really close-up views um, of the juvenile. Um, greater kestrel, also um, common in the park, uh, together with a black-ringed kite in your sort of more open woodland areas. And then I think a, a really nice um, uh, sort of raptor that you can regularly find within Macaulay is your black-chested snake eagle. Um, and uh, do look out for it just outside Lilydale um, on the power lines, I, I've usually seen them um, on, on, those, on those power lines as you, as you leave Lilydale. Um, and uh, look out for the bare legs and the, and the yellow eyes and this um, characteristic flight pattern, um, these um, two rows of, um, of, of uh, well, two black rows on the underwing, um, on the distal part, and um, three or four bands on the on the tail, together with the dark black chest and the white underparts. All right, water birds. Like I said, um, 
they uh, it's not a high diversity so you're going to be looking along the Reach River and you're going to be having a look at the pans and uh, um, spending some some time it's off dam when there's water in it um, for your water birds but along the Reach River you've got your um, very common yellow-billed duck your Cape shovelers and quite recently I've had African black duck which was a first tick for me um, uh, I think on my last trip um, you often get pine kingfishers flying um, up and down the Reach River uh, you've got Hamakorp, I don't know if you can see in the middle of that image, um, the bird was quite far away, um, but uh, um, Hamakorp um, it can be found um, flying up and down and then uh, fishing along um, in these rocky pools together with reed cormorant um, and white-breasted cormorant as well. I don't have an image of that, um, but they can be seen regularly flying up and down. But for me, um, sort of the specials when it comes to water birds uh, are your South African shell duck, at your ephemeral pans um, with, uh, within the park. And then at Lilydale, um, we always seem to find Goliath here. And, um, and uh, it's just really wonderful just to sit there with your scope or your binos and, and uh, just watch um, the, 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 the fishing antics of um, this, this enormous aquatic heron um, along the Reed River. Okay, in terms of, uh, of, of migrants, let's, um, during the summer, let's have a look at your paleotic or your long distance migrants. Um, you'll, you'll have your barn swallows. Um, I'm picking up a few individuals about three weeks ago. There should be a lot more of them at the moment. Um, your lesser gray shrike uh, will also, together with your red back shrike, I uh, probably should have put that uh, next to the lesser gray shrike, um, uh, uh, are regular common uh, Paleoarctic visitors um, to Macaulay. Uh, I, I just love this. I think I took this picture in about late March, early April. These, this lesser gray shrike was uh, just um, getting into its breeding plumage uh, and these um, soft oranges and the black mask and the, the gray hood um, was, was just really, really prominent um, uh, and really um, great that I could get that particular photograph. Uh, European bee eaters um, are common um, during summer, and like I mentioned here, we have a, a male red-backed shrike, um, uh, and they um, are also quite a, a common species within the park. Then, in, your, in terms of your intra-Africa migrants, um, you have your thing, your your greater shrike swallows um, that will uh, come back, um, and very popular around the camps. They um, have been building nests in the past, and and uh, they will you know come back to. Uh, those same nests um, that they have that they have built, but uh, generally around the watering points as well, um, you will um, find your greatest shrub swallows. Your Jacobin cuckoo, um, I've, 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 I don't see regularly um, during the, the the summer months, but uh, um, you are able to pick it up. Uh, um, and uh, this was a bird that uh, that I found, I think, in the south of the park. Um, uh, just outside of Mossu, if I'm not mistaken. Your South African cliff swallow uh, is your um, in, in endemic breeder, the only species your, that is an endemic breeder. Um, and uh, um, the, the numbers of these birds increase um, as uh, in sort of early to late spring um, and, and then on into early summer. Uh, Adiatu cuckoo as well um, uh, is um, one of your intra Africa cuckoos that. Uh, um, tends to arrive also um, in, the, in the early part of spring. So these are just some examples um, of uh, the summer migrants uh, to Mokwala. And then I've got a group called the flycatchers. Um, uh, and these are a mixture of, uh, of, of species, but these are, are, are birds that, that basically um, hunt from a perch uh, and, and uh, will um, return to the same perch um, after doing some um, aerial foraging. So we've got uh, the, the, the Marika flycatcher and the Chat flycatcher. Um, sometimes people get confused between the two. Your, your Marika has these very white underparts. It's more, more, more of a slender bird um, with a much uh, sort of longer slender tail. Your Chat flycatcher is a much more a bulkier bird um, and is um, basically uniform brown um, uh, on both the upper parts and the underparts. Uh, Fork-tailed drongo and your anteating chat uh, are two species that uh, you will get, you will definitely see um, um, when you're driving throughout the park. 
Um, and uh, I think we all know about the antics of the, the folktale Drongo um, and uh, the, um, the white wings within the, the, the anteating chat always known for me to be the helicopter bird. Uh, and then lastly, um, two bee eaters, your white fronted and your swallow tailed. Um, uh, these are uh, two bee eaters that uh, you are more than likely to, to pick up um, during uh, your um, birding ventures um, with, within Makala. Uh, the swallow tailed bee eaters um, I, I found throughout um, the, the, the park seem to be a little bit more dominant in the woodland areas. Um, um, and uh, so do look out for them um, if it's a, a bird that you do require for your list. Okay, and then uh, you know, the birds everybody kind of loves to hate um, uh, and uh, your little brown jobs and uh, just uh, having a look at some of the, of the lark species. Um, and most of these you can find while driving on the roads. Uh, um, here's a really good roadside birds to take note of. Um, so you've got your spike-heeled lark, sort of your tailless lark, um, that is quite common. The fawn colored for me is probably the most common, together with the sabota lark perhaps, um, uh, within uh, Makala. Uh, the eastern clapper lark um, is, obviously becomes a lot more noticeable and a, and a lot more audible um, during the summer months um, when it's a uh, time to breed. Um, uh, uh, and it's really got that um, very well-known sort of clapping of the wings and then the descending whistle. Um, so a very common bird within Makala and within um, the general arid and semi-arid zones. The Zabota lark um, also very common approaching on trees as you're driving um, through the road networks um, within Makala um, and the rufous snape lark as well. Um, so these are um, generally um, the, the most common larks that you will um, be able to um, pick up uh, with, with your Makala. Uh, then the other little brown jobs, your pipits and your sisticulars. Um, so I've just indicated um, a, a very limited number of species here, your African pipit uh, with uh, the white outer tail feathers, um, uh, possibly together with the buffy pipit. Uh, I must say it's uh, um, quite a common species um, um, as you drive through um, the park, especially on the main road between uh, Mosu and Lilydale. And then you've got your desert cisticular together with your sitting um, cisticular as well. And, and these are birds that become nemesis for people, but I just suggest that um, look at the habitat, look at the calls, especially during the summer months, look at their behavior. These are the kind of things that you need to look out for um, when trying to separate the desert and the sitting cisticulars. Um, there's also the cloud cisticular as well. Um, so these little brown jobs um, can be confusing, but with a little bit of extra work and uh, patience, um, one can sort through them. Uh, just some samples of shrikes, um, brown crowned chagra, I find to be quite regular in the park uh, and can also be seen with, um, with, within the camps. Uh, you've got your Western arid race of, of your Southern fiscal, um, or a common fiscal um, uh, with, with the white eyebrow, um, uh, but also, but again, um, um, it can be found quite regularly throughout the park. And then of course the bird that I really love is the brubru. Uh, and you normally hear them first. Um, uh, they've got this characteristic uh, sort of cricket sounding type two note call. Um, and I was lucky enough, I think at Camille during picnic site to um, to find this bird and uh, I got a really nice shot of it. Um, but these are just a, a sample of the kind of um, um, strikes that, uh, that, that um, one can find within the park. And then I've just thrown in some pictures of general birdings. As you're going around, um, these are just um, really uh, um, some of the, the birds that, that you will uh, most likely run into. Um, just to highlight, I think the striped kingfisher um, is, a, is a special tick. Um, Makala, you need to pay close attention while you're driving, scan the dead branches um, of the, the um, trees as you're riding past, um, and, and uh, you should be able to, um, to, to find um, individuals um, of this particular species. Uh, Southern yellow bulled hornbill is also a nice tick, uh, sort of ending up in, you know, sort of being um, part of the most southerly you know, part of, of the species range. I, I think there are records getting 
you know, that, that all further south. Um, but uh, um, they, as we know, they can be quite noisy, but they have exceptionally good and, and funny behavior and feeding antics um, if you find them in a group. Uh, yeah, so the crested barbet, um, again, uh, is, a, is a species that's um, quite common, especially at the watering points. Look out for spotted thickney um, in the thickets as you drive along, and uh, Swainson Spurfell um, uh, within some of the uh, grassland areas, and, and also the copy felt as well. Okay, now I want to focus on of thumb. Uh, this is a special place. Um, and I think you can ask any birder, this is where it all happens. And it's a, a seed eater heaven. Uh, so this is a view over here looking out of the hide. This is quite recently, the, um, there was a problem with the dam wall. So the, the, and they've been, the only rangers have been uh, trying to, uh, to fix it up. Um, I think which they have done of late, but before that it was dry for um, a few months. So, the, so there was hardly anything happening over here, but the, but what's important to take note of um, is the, the borehole here um, uh, that uh, um, uh, is, is able to pump water um, ac across to this tank and then it um, uh, uh, is flushed and it runs out um, into um, the main part of uh, Stoftum. But, it, but these little sections over here, the, the, these little openings um, within this wooden fence um, if you peer through, there's a lot of, of the water that's leaking and 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 dri dri uh, dripping on the pipes, and you must spend time um, having a look through these through these gaps because a lot of the seed eaters um, uh, will gather in uh, the umbrella thorn over here um, and then make their way down um, to the dripping water um, that's coming from these pipes, and it's really worthwhile just um, spending the the time appearing through the fence. Uh, but these are the kind of specials we have here. We've got red bull firefinch, blue wax bull, bullet eared wax bull. We've got the two wide eyes, um, and I've also shown black faced wax bull um, here as well. And you know, during mid morning, in the heat of the day, um, you're going to have a constant movement in and out um, of, um, of 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 all these seed eaters at the at the hide. Um, I put a little asterisk with blue wax bull. For me, this is a bird that I did not see in the past and seems to be becoming a lot more common um, in Makala. I see it regularly now um, at the bird hide. Um, yeah, we have nice breeding um, uh, plumage in the, the male shaft-tailed wide-eye and the long-tailed paradise wide-eye, but I've also put in the non-breeding um, sort of images here as well, um, because often when you go during the non-breeding season, um, these are the typical um, images that you are, are able to capture for these species. Um, just some of the other seed eaters, the social weavers come down, we've got southern grey-headed sparrow, black-throated canaries, we've got quillias, um, I, I wouldn't say in their thousands, but um, you know, you know, you know, possibly small groups, 10 to 50 birds regularly are coming through, up and down, um, coming for a drink. Um, a green ring petillia, I see every time I go there together with golden-breasted bunting. Yeah. So, um, and uh, these are, are, are images that, that, that I've, you know, either taken through the, the, the gaps in the wooden fence um, or peering out of the bird hide, the birds gathering on the trees um, before coming down to drink at the water's edge. And then I've just called this drinking buddies <laughs> uh, because the you know, let's see what they are. Um, uh, we've got a blue wax bull drinking with red bull fire finches. We've got a Namaqua dove coming down, lark like buntings. Um, also, um, be a part of, this, of, of the bird party. Three banded plovers, um, you will find Ridley walking around. Um, really nice to watch the quillias bathing um, as you're sitting in the hide. And you even get um, birds such as a dusky sunbird um, uh, and, and, and even white bellied that will come down um, for a drink. Okay, moving on to the Lilydale Lookout. Um, so this is what the Lookout point looks like. Um, when I was there last, they were busy reconstructing it, um, uh, but uh, hopefully it will get back to its former glory. Um, and uh, you can see a ephemeral pan in the distance there, and uh, that is, um, what you um, are having a look at, and you get all sorts of antelopes coming down to drink. 
In terms of bird life, it's not extremely rich at all. Uh, you might get some Egyptian geese coming through, your blacksmith lapwing and your three-banded plover most likely to, um, you know, to be found here. I have seen um, South African shell duck um, that um, uh, can be found um, at the pan. And if you spend some time, you could easily find a northern black Quran um, flying around the lookout point. What's nice is they've got an L box at the lookout point. Um, and uh, I'm uh, really hoping, but I'm, I'm quite sure that they will um, put the L box back up uh, during the reconstruction. This is a Western barn L. And as you can see in this particular picture, uh, which I took, I think about a month and a half ago, there are chicks um, in the L box. So it's really nice to have this opportunity to go and have a look um, at, the, at the Western barn owls that are breeding within the box at the lookout point. Um, this hut is um, a water hole or watering point halfway between um, Lilydale and uh, Mossy, right next to the main road. Um, and it's just so nice to just park your vehicle and spend some time waiting for the birds to come down and drink. So if you get there at, at mid-morning through, through to about two or three in the afternoon, there's a constant stream, again, of, of, of seed eaters that will come down. Yeah, we have sociable weavers. There's a big sociable weaver colony just to the right um, of, of this image, um, together with your southern graded sparrow over here. white browed sparrow weavers um, are also very common in the area. Um, and they will, will obviously come down to a drink um, and join uh, the Cape Starlings um, and even your cinnamon-breasted buntings I've observed drinking um, at the waterhole. And this is just a sort of a general view of what, what one can expect and you get buffalo coming down to drink warthogs, um, could do all at the same time. So, so for me, uh, the ultimate is just to sit and observe and wait for the birds to come down um, to the watering point or to the watering hole um, to, to have a drink. And while you're busy enjoying the mammals coming through, um, you'll always find um, some other exciting um, species of bird, you know, coming down to drink and being added to your list. And yeah, uh, uh, it's, a, it's um, one of the spots that my wife and I really like to spend time at. Uh, and this is at um, Camille Doran. A picnic site, uh, just a quick video, um, just to show you um, kind of you get four or five species um, that are at this reservoir, it's leaking water, um, some of the pools begin to fill up the water that catches on the side of these rocks, um, and uh, again, just taking the time um, just to wait and, and see what, what comes through to drink or to, or to bathe, um, and uh, it, it really is a seed eater heaven, um, these watering points. And, and for me, that's why I put them as the priority kind of birding spots um, where, you know, where you can spend um, really large amounts of, of time just waiting um, for um, whatever comes along. Um, so we've got um, Southern Great Aspera, we've got the Violet Head Wax Balls, we've got um, Green Wing Petitias. Um, so again, it's just a, a really nice thing um, to sit and wait. Mosu, I'm going to get have a look at a birding within the, the camps. Um, I'm not going to run through, I think, um, just in terms of um, time. Um, but uh, for me, mountain wheat here at the Mosu is really special. You know, only place that I've really picked them up. Uh, perhaps some other people have found them um, in along the kopis or along the other parts of the ridges. Um, but uh, you find dropping around um, on the on the on dolls and provide really good um, photo opportunities. Actually, tit as well is a special um, tick I find. Um, but uh, if you spend some time walking around uh, a mosu, then uh, you're more likely to hear it initially um, before actually seeing it. Um, spend some when we're spending some time at one of the on dolls. This is a um, greatest tribe swallow nest, uh, and uh, the red-headed finches were. Um, in investigating, occupying this particular nest that we that we find. So just also spend just by sitting and watching and waiting, you get a, a really good um, appreciation for for the interaction and behaviour of a lot of species that uh, perhaps one misses um, if you um, just don't take the time 
you know, to sit and, and observe. Um, Lilydale um, short-toed rock thrush um, can be observed. This was a female that I, I photographed um, on our last trip three weeks ago, but um, I, I have seen the male, um, you know, um, this particular uh, picture is from Brian Culver. I um, have only seen the male at distance um, at Lilydale. Cape bunting is another species, um, very common, very tame, hopping around the, the actual one of dolls, so great photo opportunities there. Even Karoo scrub robin um, can be um, seen hopping around um, in some of the thornfelt, uh, together with chestnut vented babblers. And for me, um, I don't often see common wax pole, um, but they were present um, at the reception area at Liddydale on my last visit. Uh, so more at Lilydale, um, the acacia pied bits of breeding um, in a, um, a dead tree. Uh, and uh, I see many bird photographers taking their chairs um, and um, sit, sitting, waiting for um, these birds to, to either enter or, um, or to exit um, the, the breeding hall. Um, a brown-throated martins um, give you a splendid show because there's um, uh, you know, literally hundreds of them flying around the reed beds along the Red River. In this last visit, uh, there were small groups that were just flying around the reception area and landing, um, and uh, there was a strong wind blowing, um, and uh, so they um, I took the opportunity, I, I think, to rest. Uh, and for me, this was a first. Um, I, I hadn't seen long-billed Cronbeck at, at Lilydale before, but here it is hopping along um, in the camps on the bra equipment um, and uh, yeah, provides very good photo um, opportunities. Do listen out for the call of the rufous cheeked nightjar. Um, actually, birds tend to fly around um, at dusk, um, uh, um, but it's a very um, um, audible call. Um, obviously, try and listen to it if you've got your, your Roberts or your Cecil Bird app, um, then you will be able to. To listen to that, um, but very, very audible and very common at Lilydale. Do look out for Bradfield Swift, um, not only at Lilydale, but I have seen them flying around um, you know, together with um, your, your white drums and your little swifts, uh, but this is quite a special tick as well um, for Macaulay. Okay, v vagrants, and st I've, 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 I've only got three species that I'm going to talk to. The one is uh, the blue crane um, and uh, Looking at the bird atlas records, they um, are only really seen around March or April, uh, particularly with uh, in the grasslands or perhaps within some of the open woodland areas. Uh, I've only seen them once um, at Macaulay. A special bird for me that I picked up in April 2018 was the dusky lark. And this is the most southwest record um, of the species when I have a look at the bird atlas map. Um, so this was um, a really, really special tick um, and very glad to get it in to um, the, the SABAP2 system. Uh, I, I haven't seen a dusky log since then. Uh, so there may have been some eruption. Um, I think we we're going through a drought at that particular um, time. Uh, so I, I keep looking out for it, um, but always just taking note of uh, the climatic conditions. And then um, the, the third and special one was Bertels Corsa. Um, in October 2018, quite close to the Lady Dell lookout point. Uh, and I believe these birds hang around or hang around for about a month um, uh, in that particular vicinity before leaving. So, so they um, most likely um, come and go depending on the conditions. Um, but uh, if you um, um, do look closely enough, um, and uh, specifically within that Lily Dell, that sort of grass felt area, um, uh, you might just be lucky enough to find a Birchall's Corsa. All right, other ac activities, you've got your usual uh, game drives and there's a, um, a one of the drives that takes you to some sand rock art, um, which uh, was on the, um, the, the farm that was purchased um, as um, a part of the Macaulay transfer. Um, and uh, it gives one um, a very nice view into the past um, with regards to the same communities that used to occupy the area. Uh, there's some uh, night drives, uh, and I must just mention, this is all from Mosu. Uh, so if you want to go on any of these drives, you will have to 
um, at, at least spend one night um, at Mosu. Uh, but, the, but the night drives are not um, only special for birds where you can pick up spotted eagle owls and rufous cheek nightjars, uh, but you're able to pick up artfark, artwolf, um, and uh, um, a whole range of other mammals on the night drives. Um, you've also got sunset drives, yeah, which um, they take you to, to areas of the park that the public um, are not allowed into. Um, and uh, yeah, you're just allowed to experience some really special moments with uh, leopard-faced vultures and white rhino. Right, uh, the other activities as well are your um, Honorary Rangers Birding Weekend and the Diamantfeld Honorary Rangers um, organizes these birding weekends um, in Makala. And I believe the one um, is coming up this coming weekend yeah, for, um, for the park. But these are great opportunities to learn more about birds, mix with other birders um, and, and just spend um, some, some real quality time, you know, doing some, some um, you know, birding and raising the money um, for the honorary rangers, which do incredible work um, within our uh, national park system. Do take a, a time to go to the interpretation center. Uh, it's just an um, uh, uh, amazing um, opportunity to go and have a look at the displays um, with regards to all sorts of things, that, um, you know, different hooves. You can feel um, um, some of the fur from the different animals. You've got one-way glass into a watering point out of here, but it's it's just very well laid out, a very professional um, and uh, really worth um, a visit. Um, this is near the Mosu campsite. I mean, the Mosu camp, Mosu lodge, um, and uh, it is really worth a visit. Right, so to, to end off, I'm just having a look at some research and citizen science. And um, one of the interesting things that occurred is the translocation of um, red billed oxpeckers back into Makala. So, so these birds used to occur in the area, but their, their populations um, became locally extinct due to um, the um, pesticides and uh, dips that were used um, uh, on the farm um, prior to the, the proclamation of Makala. And it was in September 2012 where 19 birds were relocated from a farm um, from Limpopo. Um, and they provided nest boxes um, to um, really encourage the birds to breed um, with, within Makala. And these birds um, um, obviously um, found this to be an ideal place, uh, not just in respect with the, um, the, the host that, um, on, which, on which they could feed, um, but um, the nest boxes proved very, very successful. Um, and uh, to date, the populations are, are thriving and they are able to take advantage of a whole range of different hosts from white rhino, impala, um, all the way through to giraffe and uh, buffalo. I've, I've usually seen them on, on the, uh, about the buffalo herds. Um, vulture monitoring. So um, this is a, a project that has been on the go since 2010 um, under the supervision or the, um, the coordination of Renal Fasaki, um, who works for the Endangered Wild Dove Trust. She's done outstanding work. And so highlighted here, well, this, the circle indicates the breeding area. So, so there are um, uh, uh, vultures, a number of um, nests that occur within Makala, and this is in the northwestern part. It's closed off to the public um, for obvious reasons, so there's 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 no disturbance to um, the breeding colony. But there's also a number of uh, um, a breeding pairs that breed outside of Makala on um, some of the private farms um, in the area, and uh, it's those farms that are also um, targeted as part of the white-backed vulture monitoring program. So back in 2010, things got going. 20 chicks were ringed, and we have 115 nests nowadays that are monitored. I mean, the group that's involved um, have done 702 birds. They've processed 702 birds, both with uh, um, metal rings and with these wing tags, as you can um, see in the image. And they use the T tags are used for Makala. So that's very important because if you see a vulture with a wing tag, it's very important to report the resighting. And if you know that it's got a T, you know it's from Makala. 
Um, and uh, I've put Ronell's email address in there because uh, um, you, if you do find a, a vulture with a wing tag, um, please get hold of Ronell so that uh, you can report the, the reciting. She's also requested that um, um, vultures that have um, uh, hit power lines um, or there's a suspected poisoning incident um, to also um, get hold of her um, in that regard. And then lastly, I want to talk about citizen science. I want to talk about CERBAC 2, one of the, the projects that I, I managed um, before um, leaving the animal demography unit at UCT. And this is just a, a way to map the distribution and relative abundance of birds in um, South Africa and now in, in Africa by just logging bird sightings via the Bird Lesser app. And here's a, a picture I'm taken from my phone um, of one of the trips that I did recently. Um, I managed to get to 100 species um, within the three days or two and a half days that I was there. So that's quite good going um, uh, for um, the area. Um, I downloaded information last night. Um, so out of the seven pentads that cover Mokala, uh, there's 523 Atlas cards that have been submitted by 149 observers, um, which I find um, quite impressive. It's nice to know that there's a lot of uh, people visiting Makala um, and that are actively atlasing. Um, and uh, the number of species, like I mentioned in my previous slide, is around the 270 mark. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a very nice activity because besides contributing to the Atlas project, you're able to actually map the location of species in the park. Um, and yeah, I've just um, indicated on one of my trips, I was seeing lots of pygmy falcon. Um, and I just decided to record every single location of a pygmy falcon. And so it gave me a, a very nice idea as to the distribution um, of the pygmy falcon um, with, with, within Macaulay. We know they're related to um, the distribution of the sociable weaver colonies, but I often found them far away from um, any um, sociable weaver colony um, that I could um, you know, find in particular areas. So. Um, just by, um, you, know, you know, keep on logging and you've got a specific um, uh, activity that you can do, um, you, you're really able to, to get this kind of, of um, valuable information for a particular species. But we need more, more cards submitted because we want to really understand um, how birds use Makala um, and to monitor the changes over time. But it has to be long term because we have to build in um, how the climate um, is is going to impact us. So it's really birding with a purpose. Um, and uh, one can really make a valuable contribution and a difference to bird conservation. African rock puppets, um, are they at Makala? This is a question that has come to mind. And I spoke to Darby de Swart from the National Museum, who's potentially, I think, the world guru on African rock puppets. Um, he's done a lot of work. Um, and he's found them at Hrubluswerp, he's found them at Swalu, but never really found them um, at, at Mokala. Although I, I did see it on the Sebeb 2 list, but um, I think it needs verification. I have never picked up African rock puppets, but it's quite likely that they, they, they can be found there with all that copy felt that, that is around in the southern half of the park. And I, this is just a sound clip that I got from Darby, just so that we um, are able to familiarize ourselves with the call. There, there is a lot of variation, I believe. Um, I think Darby can attest to that, but uh, this is sort of the uh, general call that one needs to listen out for. Okay, so, so if you do visit Makala, um, that really is one of the, the species that, 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 that we are really trying to, to verify. Right, so I've hopefully tried to package the birds um, into an exciting adventure for people when they go to Makala. But it's not only about the birds, it's about the mammals. And often you end up sitting at stuffed, um, a bird hide and you get these wonderful opportunities um, to, to see water buck and warthog and CCP come down to drink and roll in the mud. And sometimes you get even luckier um, and you get porcupine in the middle of the day um, coming down to, to, to have a drink. And we were um, really, really um, honored to have 
um, and, and spend time with this um, porcupine for about 15 or so minutes. So, so as much as, you, as you're watching these mammals, um, you, you've got the seed eaters coming down um, to also entertain you. And you've got a whole range of other biodiversity that, that, that one can um, really enjoy around Mokalo. Um, so uh, um, we, we, I, I think people have seen the advert now for free entry into any national park for the week of the 22nd to the 28th um, of November. And for those of you who don't have wild cards, um, uh, here's a real um, opportunity. Come and visit Mokala. Um, come and do some great birding. Um, if you are, are, are needing a few special ticks, um, hopefully I've been able to enlighten you this evening um, as to where you can find them. Uh, and uh, um, it's just an opportunity to, um, you know, um, go to the camps, spend some time enjoying the biodiversity and the avifauna um, of Mukala. Um, just as the birds leave their imprints and, and make their mark, I would like to um, acknowledge um, these people that have um, made a contribution and provided me with um, photographs or, or information for tonight's talk. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention tonight. You get these beautiful Northern Cape sunsets um, and everyone's different at Makala. Um, Makala is a special place with um, special birds and uh, please do take the time um, to visit um, one of the special arid zone parks within South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, thank you for sharing your, your expert knowledge, but also your uh, wonderful pictures with us. Um, that was incredibly uh, inspiring. And I think you, you've attracted a few new future visitors to Mokala. And I hope we see in the post webinar survey that we have some, some new birders visiting the park. Incidentally, in the, the run-up in your talk, you, you mentioned the, the name of the, the park. And uh, yeah, that, that actually something I learned this week is that it was Mark Anderson's wife, Tanya, who suggested that name. And I see Tanya's tuned in tonight. Um, of course, the Andersons were very involved with the Northern Cape Bird Conservation before Mark moved to Joburg to take up the um, spot at BirdLife South Africa as CEO. So, yeah, thanks to Tanya for actually naming that park for us. Um, what blew me away when I visited in 2015 was the amazing diversity in habitats and the associated bird diversity, which I think you, you showed us beautifully with your GIS maps. And uh, yeah, it really is a park worth visiting if you have the chance, and I do encourage you to go and visit. Um, so thank you for an excellent presentation, Doug. Um, it was a, perfectly, a perfect way to round out the Sandparks Birding Destination Series. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and um, staying with us here on Conservation Conversations. Thanks, Doug. Okay, so before we get into some questions, I'd like to remind everyone to please participate in our post-webinar uh, survey, which will pop up when you exit the webinar. It should take just two minutes to fill in. Next week, we have Adam Stratif and Duncan McKenzie, who will be giving us an overview of what to expect on Birding Big Day. Um, if you've never participated or on or on experienced big day participant, there will be something new for you. Please do join us for that next Tuesday evening. Also remember our Flock to Marion COVID Protocols webinar tomorrow at 5 p.m. and our first Seabird ID webinar on Thursday at 7 p.m. Links for both of these uh, for registration for these webinars can be found in the chat box if you scroll up a bit. So now on to some questions. I'm just going to start you off with a simple one. Doug, do you need 4x4 for any areas of the park? Um, so there are uh, specific 4x4 routes um, that I think identified in the map you know, early on in the presentation. Um, so obviously you'll need 4x4 um, for those areas. Um, but there's definitely... Um, one can access the park with, with a Dan vehicle. Um, just that when it rains, one has to be extremely careful. Often they close a lot of the of the roads of the loops um, just because of the flooding that occurs, and so there's a lot of mud around. Um, uh, and it's really the 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 main 
sort of road between the, the um, two camps that uh, sort of becomes accessible. Um, so, so one, yeah, it has to, uh, I mean, it is advisable to, if you, you know, if you've got a four by four or even a four by two, um, you know, some sort of uh, bucky or um, uh, SUV, um, it really, it does help. Uh, but uh, I know during the dry season, during the winter months, um, it's, it's really accessible with, with a normal sedan. Um, you just got to drive, um, you know, very carefully, um, especially along the access roads, getting to the park. Um, and if you do encounter rain, um, then you know, one just has to be extremely careful about which roads that you need to drive. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then a, a question from, um, coincidentally, my mother dearest, who I hope is planning the next family holiday. Um, she wants to know, um, given the, the comfort versus uh, spotting balance of temperature and, and migratory birds, when is the best time, in your opinion, to visit? Um, and of course, noting that Kimberley can both be very hot and very cold. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely got that right. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, especially during the winter. Um, I mean, there's a large temperature variation within the park. So you could go from minus six degrees in the morning um, for midwinter through to, you know, 40 degrees, um, uh, you know, in the midsummer. Um, but yeah, so one has to, um, if, you, if you're wanting to maximize your summer migrants, um, then uh, I would say that the best time um, would, would be sort of late summer. Yeah. You know, by then all the, the migrants would have arrived, um, settled down within uh, the park. Um, uh, and uh, there's a very, you know, a good chance of, you know, you know picking up all the migrants that, uh, that have arrived. Um, you have to deal with the, you know, with the hot temperatures. Um, I'm afraid if you, if you end up going at, uh, at that time of year, but one that generally tends to, to go out in the early morning, come back to um, uh, the camp, you know, um, uh, at, at about 10 or 11, you know, rest up a bit and then go out again in the late afternoon. I did find during the winter months, uh, you could basically be out all day because it's, the temperatures are quite comfortable um, compared to the, the hot summer months. Uh, but yeah, um, sort of the middle to the end of, of, of summer, I would, um, I would say would be the best time if you want to maximize um, those particular species. Great, thanks very much. Annika Hawks would like to know, are there any areas in the park where one can walk around? Yeah, walking around is actually quite limited um, um, in Makala. Um, it's generally limited to the campsites. I mean, to, to, uh, to, to the camps um, or, or, or the campsite, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you prefer camping. Um, uh, I, and I think when you go out on to do the day drives, especially if you go and have a look at the, at the sand rock art, um, uh, there's um, uh, a few paths that, 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 that one can walk, but you obviously need to go with a guide and, and things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very limited. Um, I know that some of the other national parks, uh, there's sort of hiking trails, um, you know, that one can take leading out from uh, the, the camps themselves, uh, but in uh, the, you unfortunately limited to, to walking around within the camps themselves um, in Mokala. All right, uh, Gary Boyle would like to know, um, you mentioned night drives, is that worth it from a birding perspective for owls and nightjars? And then so what nocturnal mammals might you expect? Um, you yeah, know, I definitely think night drives are worth it, um, but I, I would suggest rather go in spring uh, or early summer to do the night drives. Uh, I once went on a winter night drive and it, <laughs> I can attest that it wasn't <laughs> a most pleasant experience. Uh, although we did, I mean, it was actually quite amazing. It, it was cold um, uh, and and uh, we we saw black rhino and we saw artfuck and we saw um, the orifice cheek nacho. <laughs> it was like towards the end of winter, you know. Um, so it was just beginning to go into spring, um, and and uh, but uh, I think just in terms of having a, a comfortable temperature um, and to, and to enjoy the experience, 
you know, it's uh, going to be far better to go sort of, you know, during the, 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 the summertime. Um, and yeah, picking up um, all sorts of um, um, mammals. Um, I mean, you, you, you basically find a lot of the things you would see during the day, but, but, but art folk and art wolf um, are a definitely um, species that one is likely to see. I, I can't say they guaranteed. Um, it depends on the driver, it depends on the route that they take. But if you make those requests, then they um, um, are very obliging and, and they will certainly do their best to try and find um, those specials for you. Uh, so I, I think it's definitely um, worth it and you will definitely find a lot more birds um, during the, the, the summer months rather than during the winter. Um, it's an experience to go during the winter, but yeah, I, I would, <laughs> I would, I would uh, yeah, definitely say rather well, stick to the summer months for that. Okay. Um, Sybil Gusman would like to know, before the proclamation of the park, do you have any idea of what the land use was in the area? Um, yeah, so when you look at the uh, vegetation map, um, you look at, you know, the GIS, there's, um, the, there's some old, um, agricultural areas. You know, there, there's some old um, uh, sort of rangelands um, that, that were converted into farmland. Um, the, the, you, it's it's you know sort of the areas are in the in the sort of you know northeastern part and the south and the southwestern part. Um, the, you know, the southwestern part uh, there there is no public access. You know, so um, in terms of um, the, the road net are, are, are limited to uh, the, the public roads. Um, but yeah, there, 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 there was definitely some disturbance with regards to um, the landscape in the past. Yeah, so it was um, uh, a, a sort of normal working farm to a large degree with some a game on it. Um, and uh, yeah, those areas show up um, in the vegetation map. Okay. Right, there are a few other questions, but what I'm going to do is, um, I think you and I are going to type answers to them rather, because I'm going to wrap it up here. We usually wrap up at half past and that's now um, 22. So I'm just going to close us out by saying thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, this this webinar will be available on YouTube uh, tomorrow from tomorrow afternoon. So you're welcome to catch up with this webinar as well as uh, any of our previous webinars we're now on about 75 episodes and still going strong so please do go and subscribe to our youtube channel uh, please do fill in the post webinar uh, survey and those results really help us um, along the way and it'll only take you two minutes um, so thank you to the audience for tuning in um, it's amazing that we have such a loyal audience here on conservation conversations we'll see you tomorrow night if you're a fox marion passenger or on thursday to uh discuss seabird ID with Trevor Hardacre. Otherwise, next Tuesday, we have our birding big day webinar.